Hi everyone and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video it's going to cover classification, taxonomy, binomial and phylogenetic or phylogeny classification. So we'll begin with the binomial system and this is the way that you can name organisms and it's a universal method so regardless of the country, language, all scientists will follow the binomial system. And this is where a organism is named. Um, the first part is their genus, and the second part of the name is the species. So binomial, bi means two, nomial means name. So there's two parts to the name. And we've got some examples down here. We've got the New Zealand robin, which is the common name that we use in English. Um, and then we've got its binomial name at the bottom. So the Protroca is the genus, Australis is the species. Robin, so we can see here we've got the Erythicus is the genus part of the name and the Rubecula is the species. Now the way that this is conventionally presented is it would always be in italics, the genus gets a capital, the species does not. So the advantage of this is it gives you a much, much better idea of how closely related organisms are. Because if we just use this common name, which we've used in the English language, it's very misleading. We've got the New Zealand robin, and we've got just a robin here. And you might think from those names that they're very closely related, but they're not actually. And we can see that from the binomial name. They're not the same species, they're not even the same genus, so they are not very closely related. So that's the advantage of the binomial system. Number one, it's universal, so everyone will use the same system, but also it's a way for you to see how closely related different species are, to see are they in the same genus. So another example we've got here is um, we've got a tiger and a jaguar, and this time we can see that the name, the common name, gave no indication as to the fact that they are closely related, but they are actually closely related. So although they're a different species, they're both in the Panthera genus. So that then gives you information that these two species are closely related. So why do some species look similar, even though they're a different species? And we've got here the example of a camel and a llama. So they've got lots of similar physical observable features. And the reason for this links back to natural selection and evolution. So they both live in similar environments, so they might have similar climatic conditions. Therefore, they're going to be exposed to similar selection pressures, and that then leads us through the stages of natural selection. So that means similar alleles within their gene pools will have the selective advantage. Those will then give that individual um, an advantage to survival. They'll reproduce and pass on that allele. So you'll find that the same or very similar alleles will become common in those two different species populations. And because the allele is coding for a protein, that means they're making similar proteins and therefore similar characteristics. So classification systems then, and this links to what we were looking at with the binomial naming system. One way to classify is using this hierarchy system. And you do need to know what a hierarchy means in terms of classification. And it's always a two mark question on an AQA paper. And it's always these exact two answers. So number one, smaller groups arranged within larger groups. Number two, there's no overlap between the groups. So what does that actually mean? Having a look at this diagram, we can see we have a hierarchy. And we'll go through this definition with the hierarchy. So domain is the broadest way to classify organisms. And that just classifies into three groups. Archaea, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Then we have the kingdoms, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And we call each of these groups, is called a different taxa. So where it says a hierarchy, small groups arranged within large groups, if we look at species and genus. So species 
are our smaller groups. But within the same genus, you can have lots of species. So for example, we looked at a tiger and a jaguar, two different species, but they're both found within the same genus. So that is our smaller groups arranged within a larger group. So the smaller group is species, but you have lots of different species within a genus. And that's the same as you travel up our hierarchy. Now, where it says there's no overlap between groups, what we mean here is, although there's lots of different species that are in the same genus, there is no overlap in those species. So a tiger is a completely different species to a jaguar. They cannot make fertile offspring together. So that's what the definition means. Now, this exact classification system, you do need to know off by heart. And the most common way this gets assessed is they will give you all of these taxa lined up in order, but they'll miss some of them out and you have to fill in what are the missing taxa. So come up with a mnemonic just to help you to remember domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So what is the point of going to all this effort to classify organisms in the first place? Well, there are absolutely millions of species. There's still lots that are undiscovered as well. So we need a way to organize them. The reason for that is it helps us to understand relationships between organisms. That helps us to track changes. Now, whether that is tracking and understanding evolution or the impact of climate change or the impact that humans are having, it can be a whole range of reasons. And as I said, we use the binomial system, genus and species, but also this classification system, the Linnaeus system, is universal. So that means you can share data globally to help keep track of organisms. So the way that organisms are then put into these different groups, you have to be able to identify similarities and differences. And originally, this was just based on visible differences and similarities. So it could be appearance, behavior, fossil records. The downside with that is some members of the same species can look completely different. So if you think about dogs, for example, um, dogs, there are loads of different breeds that can look completely different, but they're still all the same species. Or on the other hand, you could have two different species which look very, very similar. So you might mistake two different species and think they're the same one. So that's why it's no longer done just on appearance and we use much, much more modern and accurate methods. And these are your four methods that you need to know. Now the top three, it explicitly says on the AQA spec that you need to know looking at how similar the DNA base sequence is or looking at how similar the mRNA base, base sequence is or looking at how similar amino acid sequences are. The more similar the sequence, the more closely related the organisms are. The fourth one is actually only on the spec where it says students should be able to also have an awareness of immunological comparisons as well. And this is where you compare how closely related organisms are based on how similar their antigens are on their own cells. And therefore, any self antibodies they make, they compare the shapes. And the more similar the shape, the more closely related they are. So the last thing then is the phylogenetic classification. So phylogeny or phylogenetic classification this is still the idea of grouping organisms according to some kind of similarity, but this time it's specifically focusing on evolutionary origins and evolutionary relationships. So this is a really useful classification system to be able to look at how closely related different species are, but also where it says studying relationships, what we mean by that is studying which species share common ancestors. And what that means is a species that they evolved from. And you can see that on phylogenetic trees. 
So that's what we've got here. We've got a whole range of different species, including humans right at the top. And every time there is a branch in this tree, so where it forks or splits into, in this case, two different species, this point here represents the human and chimpanzee most recent common ancestor. So that is the species that humans and chimpanzees evolved from. So when you learn more about speciation, the common ancestor is the original species, but it diverged into humans and chimpanzees. And then the further to the left we go is going further back in time. And if we go all the way back, we can see every single one of the species on this list here um, ultimately evolved from the same common ancestor. It just would have been many, 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 many generations ago. We haven't got an indication of years here, um, but it could be as far back as millions of years that this common ancestor existed. So that is it for classification. I hope you found it helpful. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to keep up to date.